Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Live from PON. Today, William Yuri will speak to us about getting to yes in challenging times. My name is Susan Hackley, and I'm so happy to welcome you on behalf of the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. Program on Negotiation is a consortium program of Harvard, MIT, and Tufts universities. This talk will be recorded and in a few days will be posted on the PON website. As we can see in chat, you come from all over the world. And many of you like us in the United States are really suffering the effects of the coronavirus pandemic. We hope that you, your families, friends and coworkers are doing well in this difficult time. I wanna thank Diane Long and Anna Chang for helping us today and Liza Hester. Uh, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And if you have a comment, you can write it in chat. Now I'm really happy to introduce today's speaker. William Urey is a world-renowned thinker, mediator, advisor, and author. He's a co-founder of the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School and the author of several landmark books, including Getting to Yes, Negotiating Agreement Without Giving In. He's also the founder of the Abraham Path Initiative, an historic and cultural walking trail in the Middle East. He's done work around the world helping people deal with conflict, including serving as a negotiation expert to Colombia President Juan Manuel Santos. Those efforts led to an historic peace agreement. We're so pleased to welcome William Urey today to share his insights. Thank you, Susan. Uh, welcome everyone from around the world. Uh, it's a pleasure, a uh, real pleasure. Uh, I see a lot of people from Brazil, bom vindo, todos, and, uh, and from Africa, from Europe, from Australia, uh, from every continent, south, north. And we're, as Susan just mentioned, we're living in extraordinarily challenging times. Uh, pandemic, economic recession, climate crisis, and political polarization. These crises affect every aspect of our lives, every aspect of our negotiations, from family to work to the larger society. And many of us are, are, are suffering. Um, a week from today in this country, uh, as you know, we face a polarizing election that may be that may lead to we don't know unprecedented levels of violence and disruption we don't know i personally have been a student of negotiation and conflict for over 40 years and i have to say i've never seen a time when it was more necessary for us individually and collectively to learn how to negotiate how to negotiate wisely how to get to yes how to get to the right yes. And that's what it really what I wanna speak with you about today. What kind of getting to yes do we need in order to meet today's challenges at home, at work, and in the world? Over these past uh, four decades, I've had the privilege of, being, of having a front row seat on a revolution that's a silent revolution that accompanies the knowledge or information revolution. It's a revolution in the way in which we make decisions, uh, whether it's at home, at work, or in the world. Uh, traditionally, a generation or two ago, perhaps the dominant way to make decisions was very much top down. The people on the top of the pyramids of power you know, gave the orders and the people on the bottom follow the orders. Increasingly today, thanks to the information revolution, thanks to the internet, thanks to all kinds of globalization, the form of decision-making is basically shifting. The pyramids of power are gradually flattening themselves into networks, networks of negotiation. The form of decision-making is shifting from vertical to more horizontal. And I, I just like you to think about your own experience, just to illustrate it. Whatever part of the globe that you're living in right now, uh, think about for a moment, your day, who do you negotiate with in the course of your day? And negotiation, I mean, very broadly speaking, you know, back and forth communication, you're trying to reach agreement with someone, 
You may have some interests which are shared, like an ongoing relationship, other interests which are intention. Who do you find yourself negotiating with in the course of your day? Just think about it for a moment. Uh, you know, at home, at work, in the neighborhood, and just ask yourself this question. Uh, what percentage of your time do you think you spend engaged, broadly speaking, in the act of back and forth communication, trying to reach agreement? In other words, through negotiation. You could put it up in the chat. What's What's your percentage? If you had to, what fraction of your time do you think you spend negotiating? Uh, how, whatever issues, there we go, 100%. My kids every day, 98%. Small children, 98% with my daughter. You know, the, some of the more difficult negotiations, of course, are the ones we all experience at home. Let me ask you uh, one more question. Think about the 10 most important decisions you had to make last year, in this last year. How, how many of them could you just make purely by yourself? And how many of them did you actually have to reach with others, with someone else, with other people? In other words, through a consensual process like negotiation. Of the 10 most important decisions you had to make last year, how many of them did you in effect need to negotiate? What would you say? How many? None by myself, you know, 100%, 10 out of 10. So that's the negotiation revolution right there that we're seeing in the chat. That's what's happening. And I've, I've had the privilege of traveling around the world over the last decades. And I see this revolution happening everywhere. So the question is now, is facing the crises that we now face, uh, what, how do we get to yes? How do we get to yes in these challenging situations? How do we, it's been about, uh, it's about 40 years that ago that uh, I worked with uh, Roger Fisher and Bruce Patton on a little book called Getting to Yes. And it had certain principles that we tried to codify of what we thought saw making for successful negotiation in our own experience and by studying the experience of others. Things like separate the people from the problem, you know, attack the problem, not the person, be soft on the person, hard on the problem, or Focusing on the underlying interests behind people's positions. What are the underlying needs or concerns, fears that people have? Then on the basis of those interests, invent options for mutual gain, you know, expand the pie rather than just divide it up. When it comes to questions of conflict, use objective criteria, criteria of fairness, independent standards of fairness to try to resolve disputes. Know your best alternative to a negotiated agreement, what we call your BATNA. You know, the goal of all of this was to somehow change the game of conflict, change the game of negotiation from what was so often a win-lose contest where each side is kind of confronting the other side to side by side searching for mutual gain. And this was popularized in the language as kind of a win-win. What's a win for both sides? Now, win-win doesn't mean that both sides get everything that they want. Rather, it means that each side's basic interests, basic needs are met, are satisfied better than they would otherwise by resorting to their BATNA, to their alternative, whatever the alternative is. Now, these methods over the last 40 years, as I've witnessed, have stood the test of time. They work, and they often work very well. But... What I'd like to discuss with you today is I believe we need more than that. Based on my experience, I believe we need more audacious, more ambitious methods of negotiation to deal with the crises that we face. Because in today's world, we're faced not just with win-lose games, but with what I would call lose-lose-lose games in which everyone loses, even though apparent winners often lose, and the biggest loser is the community as a whole. And a good example is, is war. I see a number of you, a lot of you come from Europe. You know, I spent my, much of my early childhood in Europe in the wake of the two tragic wars, World War I and World War II. You know, I've spent much of my life working on how to prevent a nuclear war. Well, in nuclear war, there are no winners. There's only losers and everyone loses. And the same is true for smaller wars. Um, I spent seven years recently working as a negotiation advisor for the president of Colombia, Susan just mentioned, Juan Manuel Santos, 
trying to bring to an end to a war that many, most people thought was impossible to end. It had gone on for 50 years. It was almost 300,000 people had died. There were more than 8 million victims. Everyone lost, and most of all, the ordinary people. Lose, lose, lose. And closer to home right here, as I mentioned, we're about to face an election, which is a classic you know, win-lose contest. Who's going to win? But one that can very easily result in a lose, lose, lose outcome, where even the winners lose. You know, according to recent polls, a majority of Americans are now worried that the political polarization here in this country could possibly lead even to a civil war. I mean, that's unimaginable for a country that's been as stable as ours. So whoever wins this election, we could all lose if we don't find a way to unite again as a country against violence and for democracy. So that's the challenge we face. And that's why I think it's time for us to think beyond just win-win to, I would say, win-win-win, where there's a third win that always has to be in our minds and our hearts, which is a win for the whole, a win for the family. If that's a family negotiation, you're negotiating with your daughter, as you mentioned, the workplace, you know, the whole organization, whether that's the neighborhood or the community or whether that's the whole country or whether that's the whole world and, and, the, and the global environment that we're facing right now. So we need to find ways to negotiate wisely in a way that produces not just mutual benefit, but also benefit for the whole. We need to learn how to change the game from a lose, lose, lose game to a win, win, win game as it were. It's an ambitious goal. It's not easy to achieve, but with sufficient effort and skill, I believe from my own experience that it's possible. I say that because I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in difficult family disputes. I've seen it happen in difficult business disputes, and I've seen it happen in the larger societies. I've seen, I just saw it happen in Colombia. I've seen it happen in South Africa and Northern Ireland. So what I want to talk to you about is what does it do? Changing the game requires us to do three things. I'm going to share a few slides just to kind of illustrate this for a moment. So if you imagine for a moment, uh, you know, what, what does it take? What does it take? And this, is, this diagram, I think, kind of illustrates it. These are three concepts that I've worked on uh, over the last 30 or 40 years since getting to yes. You know, in the middle, it's, it, we're, you know, in a conflict, you're trying to build a bridge. You know, you're trying to build a bridge with your daughter or your boss or the community here in this country are trying to bridge, build a bridge between Democrats and Republicans. It's not easy, you know. Uh, I grew up partly in San Francisco and this looks a little bit like the, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge, if you, if you imagine it. And getting to yes focuses on techniques for how do you build that bridge. What I've found uh, is that it's actually, Building, you know, building that bridge is the core of the method of negotiation, but there are two pillars, those two pillars on either side that are critical if we're gonna be successful in getting to yes in challenging times. And that's the first pillar of what I call the balcony, which I'll explain in a moment. And the second pillar, which I call the third side. And I believe that we need all three, all at the same time, if we're gonna audaciously take on the challenge of changing the game from lose, lose, lose to win, win, win. So let me, uh, it, we need all three. And we, and I'll call this method just as a short thing. It's BB3, you know, balcony, bridge, third side, as it were. So before I go into it and just explain what I mean by this, I think it'll be very useful if you have in mind at least one very challenging negotiation or conflict that you're currently faced with. It might be a conflict at home, it might be a conflict at work. It might be a conflict you're concerned about in the larger society. I see someone is from Armenia here, you know, Nagorno-Karabakh. You know, whatever the challenge is, it just seems so overwhelming. Um, take one that might, you know, that where you can see a kind of a lose, lose, lose dynamic relating. You know, it could be related to the pandemic or economic or political crises that we're facing. So let me just start by, so the, the, um, let me play. 
And just the, the overall mo model is the, in the first, just a master model here is that the first thing is we have to go to the balcony. Uh, that's the first thing we need to do. Second thing is we build that bridge. Third thing is we activate the third side. Going to the balcony, what does it do? It brings us from a reactive state of mind to a creative state of mind, which yields the first win, which is a win with ourselves. This is first person work. Building a golden bridge, which where you shift from either or thinking to both hand thinking yields the classical win-win. And activating the third side, which shifts from us versus them to we brings what we need, which is that third win, which was the win-win-win. So if we think about it for a moment, just imagine the balcony. Um, the biggest obstacle I've found in the last 40 years to us getting to yes, interestingly, is not what we often think it is. You know, I, I wrote my first book about how do you deal with, negotiate with difficult people? You know, and we all face difficult people, difficult situations. But what I found is that actually the biggest obstacle to neg in negotiation, the biggest obstacle to us getting what we really want in negotiation is not the person on the other side of the table, as difficult as that person is, it's right here, it's ourselves. The biggest obstacle is the person we look at in the mirror every morning. We, are, we get in our own way. We become our own worst enemies often because we humans very naturally we're reaction machines. And when angry, we tend to make the best speech we'll ever regret. So the first work to me, the foundation of successful negotiation is the ability to step back from the situation and go to a balcony. It's almost like you're negotiating on a stage. It's like a play and all the players are there, the parties and so on is the ability to step back for a moment and go to a mental and emotional balcony where it's a place of calm, a place of self-control, a place of perspective, where you can pause for a moment, where you can remember what the prize is, keep your eyes on the prize, what is it you really want? It's a place where you can see the bigger view, where you can zoom out. And, uh, and you know, we do that very practically by, we, you know, like right now, we're on the balcony thinking about our negotiations. Before you go into a negotiation, you prepare, you're on the balcony. Uh, you take breaks, that's time on the balcony. And then during the actual interaction with others, you know, there are ways that we take to go to the balcony, whether it's just to pause for a moment, uh, it might be to uh, take a deep breath. There are various ways. And what that allows us to do is it allows us, uh, just psychologists have developed, you know, very simple models here are, that are based on the human nervous system. Essentially, it allows us to go to a place of calm. If you think about it, you know, we, we often, particularly in negotiation in these crises that we face today, we're often in hyper arousal zone, that upper zone where there's a lot of emotional reactivity, there's defensiveness, we're impulsive, there's a lot of anger and excitement right now, collectively right now in the United States, there's a lot of hyper arousal around the election. Uh, similarly, we can all, there's also hypo arousal where, where, the, where, where in fact, there's little arousal where you see, oh, it's just so overwhelming, all these crises, COVID, e economics, political polarization, and we tend to numb, we disconnect, we shut down, it's overwhelming. What we're trying to do in negotiation is try to keep ourselves and the people around us in that middle zone, which might be called the optimal arousal zone, where we're, we can bring our full potential. We're open, we're curious, we're aware of, uh, we're aware of boundaries, we're, we have, we're, we're in the present moment, we're at our best. You know, everyone who's in sports knows you know, that that's the zone where we perform our best if you're in music or sports, and it's also true in negotiation. How do we stay in that zone? So I just wanna ask you for a moment, uh, if you think about it, what's your, what is your uh, favorite way of, of um, what is your favorite way of going to the balcony? And if you wouldn't mind putting in chat, what's your, what's your, what's your favorite way to go to the balcony? What do you do to go to the balcony? 
writing, be alone for a bit, pray, listen to music, depersonalize it, journal, mindfulness, calm down, you know, uh, relax, spend time with your dog. You know, dogs and pets actually co-regulate us. They, they help us calm down. I see a lot of people, particularly nowadays, you know, just spending time with their animals because animals are calmer. They, they bring us down, drink a beer, you know, meditation. Uh, so all those are ways of doing that. Uh, I, you know, what's perhaps most difficult is of course, when you're in the presence of the other side, that's when it's harder to stay in that optimal zone. Uh, what uh, theorists of what's called polyvagal theory, because it has to do with the polyvagal nerve and the nervous system maintains us in that optimal zone. I, if I, I think about uh, just one, one instance where I was really challenged and where I really began to think about how important this was, was I was involved in the country of Venezuela about 20 years ago. I'd been asked by, by former President Carter to go and meet with then President, President Hugo Chavez and to speak because there were a million people on the streets of Caracas demanding his resignation and a million people on the streets supporting him and international observers were very worried that this could lead to major violence, like the kind of violence in Colombia. And uh, in one of my meetings with him, um, he liked to meet at night. He said, you know, it was set for nine o'clock. I went to the palace with my friend Francisco Diaz from Argentina, and we waited patiently, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight. Finally, we're ushered in to see the president, expecting to find him alone. But in fact, he was surrounded by his entire cabinet. And uh, he motioned to a, a seat. He said, Yuri, I take a seat here. Now tell me, what do you think? What do you, how's the situation here? What's your view of, of the conflict right now? And I thought I would put a positive spin on it. And I thought, you know, well, Mr. President, I've been talking to some of your ministers. I've been talking to the leaders of the opposition. It seems to me there's a little bit of progress. Well, that wasn't the word he wanted to hear. That triggered him. He said, progress, what are you talking about? You don't see those dirty tricks those traitors are up to on the other side. You're blind, you're naive, you know? And he went on and he leaned very close to my face and he proceeded to shout at me for approximately, I would say 30 minutes. Uh, and there I was, you know, just like thinking, oh, I've been working in this con conflict for a year, all that work down the drain you know, feeling a little embarrassed being shouted at in front of the president. You know, I was watching, but I went to the balcony and I started to watch my internal reactions, it started to settle down. And, I tr and on the balcony, you're trying to remember what's most important to you. What was most important to me was trying to calm the situation, trying to help, you know, Venezuelans find a peaceful solution. So I, you know, I asked myself, is it, you know, I felt like, you know, my reaction was I felt like defending myself. I'm not naive and so on. But would that really ad advance the cause if I got into an argument with the president of Venezuela? So I decided just to be quiet on the balcony there. A friend of mine had said, you know, pinch the palm of your hand. And I'd said, why, Hernan? He said, well, because that will uh, give you a temporary pain. It'll keep you alert. So I remember that to pinch the palm of my hand and I just, bit my tongue and I listened to him. I listened very deeply to what he was saying. And he was a man who would go on for hours. He'd give speeches for eight hours. But since I wasn't reacting, you know, after about 30 minutes, he began to kind of run out of steam. And I was just watching his body language. His shoulders sank a little bit. And finally, he said to me in a weary tone of voice, he said, so Yuri, what should I do? Now that is the faint sound of human mind opening. And so I said, you know, Mr. President, it's almost Christmas. Last Christmas festivities were canceled because of the conflict. Why not everyone have a truce, a tregua, a truce just for three weeks, give everyone a break from the conflict and everyone can enjoy Christmas with their, with their, with their families and we'll come back in January. Perhaps everyone will be in a better mood to listen. So in other words, the whole country needed to go to the balcony. Well, he looked at me and he said, that's an excellent idea. I'm going to propose that in my next speech. And his mood had completely shifted. In fact, he said, you know, over Christmas, you should come down here and travel the country with me, see the country. And then he thought for a moment, he said, yeah, but I guess it'd be a problem because you're a neutral. He said, you might not be seen as neutral. He said, no problem. I'll give you a disguise. You know, his mood had completely shifted. What I learned from that 
is one of the greatest powers you have in a negotiation is the power not to react. It's to go to the balcony. It's to listen instead. So that's, that's the key, is to shift from a reactive state of mind to a creative state of mind. Now, if you notice, the word reactive and creative have the same letters. It's just that the C is in a different place. That's what we're shifting from reactive to creative so that we can bring our full potential on a very difficult situation. So uh, that brings us to the next challenge. That's the B, the first B, that's the balcony. So building a golden bridge, that's the next challenge. Uh, how do we do that? Um, because normally speaking, in negotiation, what do we do? Uh, when it's a difficult negotiation, we tend to try to apply pressure or push people in the direction of what we think is a good solution. But what do they usually do when we push? They resist. So what you find successful negotiators often doing is the opposite of pushing, which is to attract, which is to make it easier for the other side to move in the direction you want them to move, which is what I, I, I use the metaphor of building a golden bridge, which comes from Sun Tzu, from an ancient Chinese sage, uh, building a golden bridge. Now, let's see, let me play. And, uh, and the key there in building a golden bridge, it begins by putting, in other words, you have to start where the other side is, because all too often we're starting from our position. Building a golden bridge, we need, to, we need to leave our thinking for a moment, it's not so easy, and start from where they are. Listen to them, find out what their key interests are. And then since what we're trying to do is persuade them, but I find it often helpful when you're dealing with a very difficult situation. It's almost like I live here in the mountains and you know, if I try to put myself at the bottom of the mountain, try to imagine climbing to the top of the mountain, that's really hard. But if I imagine myself on the top of the mountain and think about how I got up there, it becomes easier. So I often find in negotiation, difficult situations, it's good to work backwards. So what we work backwards from here is what might be called their victory speech. Because in the end, if we're gonna reach a solution, it has to be a win for us, but it also has to be a win for them. And so what I find very useful is to, is to think about what am I proposing to the other side and then put it through what I call the victory speech test, which is to imagine that the other side says yes to your proposal. Imagine that they're saying yes to your proposal. Now, how could they explain why they said yes to you, to the people they most care about, their constituency? What would be their key talking points? I put it through the victory speech test. And, uh, and I find that's very helpful. That's, you know, you, you, you can fill out, there's a form you can fill out there. So if you think about it, I want you to go back for a moment to your own situation, the one that you picked to work on. Think about who is the other party in your negotiation. Think about if they were to say yes to you, what would be their victory speech? What would be their way of saying, this is a good idea, this meets my interests? What would be the key themes? You think about it, if you had to list like three key talking points or key themes, key benefits for them, what would be their victory speech if they said yes to you? Imagine that. So let me give you an example. Um, about three years ago, my colleagues and I were growing increasingly alarmed about the, the possibility of a escalating conflict between the United States and North Korea. North Korea was testing nuclear weapons, nuclear missiles. Uh, President Trump was saying this will not happen. He threatened fire and fury, as you recall. You know, each side threatened war with each other. Uh, the risk of war went up to where experts were saying it was 20%, 30%, 50%. Even the president of the United States thought there was a 50% chance of an unimaginable war where nuclear weapons would be fired for the first time since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Unimaginable, millions of people dead. And so my colleagues and I began to think about how do we how do we reduce the risk here? How do we prevent a nuclear war between the United States and North Korea? And the first thing we did was we thought about 
well, what would President Trump's victory speech be? What would be the Korean leader Kim Jong-un's victory speech? And we've thought, we thought about what are the key bullet points? For, for Trump, it would be, you know, I've made America safe again. This is the deal of the century. You know, I did what my predecessors couldn't do and it won't cost us a penny. For Kim's speech, it might be our country is safe. Our economy will grow and prosper. We have the respect we deserve. You know, I've completed my father and grandfather's dreams. And then if you start from the victory speeches, then you, then you orient your whole activity to how do I make it easier for them to give that victory speech? And that's the key. So that's, that's what I find is so helpful as a tool in dealing with very difficult situations like, like North Korea uh, and the United States. So that brings me then to the third uh, pillar you know, uh, of, of the bridge, which is the, the third side. Uh, because sometimes, sometimes uh, going to the balcony and building a bridge may not be enough in today's crises. And that's why we need a third strategy. And that's to activate what I call the third side. And this is the oldest human heritage for dealing with conflict. I've watched it in, in the simplest societies in the world, which is the third side is the community. You activate the larger community. If you think about it in, a, in, a, in any negotiation, you know, there's side one and side two. There's often two sides in a negotiation. But what we often don't see is there's always a third side, which is the neighbors, the friends, the family members, the bystanders, the neutrals. Uh, and some of them are outsiders. Some of them may be very close to the parties themselves, insiders. But altogether, they make up a community. And within that community, it becomes easier to deal with even the most difficult situations. So think for a moment um, about your situation. Uh, your, whatever the negotiation, it's you and your daughter, you know, or you and your boss or a conflict. Where's the third side? Who else is involved in that situation? Who can be, who can be involved in a positive way in helping you resolve what may be a very difficult conflict? Now, my colleagues and I have spent our lives as third siders, you know, often, and many of you too, I imagine, are, you know, play the role of the third side, your mediators. Uh, but the third side goes well beyond being a mediator. You can just be an interested party. You can even be on one side or the other and still be a third sider. You know, I saw that most dramatically when I was in South Africa in the 80s and 90s. Nelson Mandela was a leader on one side of the conflict but he was clear that he was fighting for the whole. He made it very clear in his Rivonia trial in 1964 that he was fighting not just for the freedom of the, of the blacks, but the freedom of the whites. He was, he was a third side leader. And that's really what's needed in today's world of all these crises is leadership that stands for the whole. The third side helps us go to the balcony. It helps big build bridges. And I'll, I'll just give you uh, one, one example, if I may, uh, from a business context, since I've been talking more about uh, political negotiations, but a business context. I see a number of you are from, from Brazil. Uh, about uh, seven years ago, I was approached by the daughter of one of Brazil's best known businessmen, Abilio Diniz, who with his father had formed had built up Brazil's largest retailer, Pão de Açúcar. And he was in a titanic battle with his business partner, who was a Frenchman, uh, and over control of the board, control of the company. This battle had been going on for years. Uh, each side had spent millions of dollars fighting each other in court. Uh, there were 150,000 employees. It was very, very ugly. It was all over the front pages. The Financial Times, I think, called it the largest cross-continental boardroom showdown in recent history. It was it really, and, and uh, Abilio's daughter, Ana Maria, called me up and said, you know, could, could I help? Uh, and I said, I don't know if I can help, but uh, I was uh, down in Brazil uh, about a month later, and I went to see Abilio in his home with his family, his kids were, were around him. And the question I had for him 
as a as a you know as a third side was like Abilio, you know, you seem to have everything. You know, he was 76 at the time. Uh, you seem to have everything. What do you really want here? And as a good intelligent businessman, he gave me a list of everything he wanted. He wanted the stock at a certain price, he wanted the company headquarters, he wanted the elimination of the non-compete clause. But then I said to him, but Abilio, I understand all that, but those, you know, those are your positions, as it were. But what do you really want? What do you most want? And he looked at me for a long time and finally he said, you know what I want? I want libertad. And what I, in other words, I want freedom. I want my freedom. Uh, and freedom meant a lot to him because in an earlier phase of his life, uh, he'd been kidnapped and held hostage for a week in a coffin. So freedom meant a lot to him. He wanted his freedom. I said, freedom for what? Freedom to live my life, freedom to make the deals, freedom to spend time with my family, which is so precious to me. So then I thought, well, I don't know if I can get you a hold of your positions, but maybe I can help you find a way to, to get freedom. So uh, to make a long story short, you know, two months later, I found myself in Paris having uh, lunch with uh, a friend, a mentor of the, of the French partner, a very celebrated uh, French banker. And he said, why are you here? I said, parce que la vie est trop court, because life is too short for these battles in which everyone loses because both protagonists were losing, but their families were losing and suffering. 150,000 employees were losing. Even the two countries were in some kind of conflict where the presidents had to engage each other because, because the conflict had escalated. So everyone was losing from this. It was lose, lose, lose. So he said, well, how would you solve it? I said, well, if we could simply agree on these two principles, two interests that I think each of the party shares, which are freedom, each one wants freedom to go on with their own lives and dignity. Neither side can afford to be seen as losing this if we could fashion a deal. So he said, well, come around tomorrow. And we, over 40 minutes uh, in his office, we fashioned a, on the back of a little piece of paper what a deal would look like. Which would, uh, which would give each one the freedom that they wanted, uh, where there were very few numbers. It was just like, you know, it was sh shares being traded for each other, the elimination of the non-compete clause. And four days later in Sao Paulo, Brazil, we had both men at a law office signing an agreement, putting an end to the dispute, wishing each other well, joint statements, going to the company, explaining to the company executives, and the conflict was over. It, and it was over in a way such that when I asked Abilio uh, how he felt about it, had he gotten everything he wanted? He said, I got everything I wanted. He said, but the most important thing is I got my life back. And when I talked to the representative of the other partner, he said, yeah, we feel absolutely satisfied. So it went from a lose, lose, lose situation to a win-win-win situation. How? By helping the parties go to the balcony, build a bridge, by activating the third side, which was the family contacting me, myself, my colleague, David Lax, the, the, the French banker, we all created a third side within which this very difficult conflict could transform. So that's the key. That's the, uh, that's the key for the third side. The third side, what do you do? It's very important, it's about access. You know, you, you build, every third side, you have access to the people. Like I, you know, the, the family had access. You build credibility, you build trust. And above all, what you then do is you swarm the conflict. You use what's called swarming intelligence, which is what biologists call this. It's a phenomenon in which, you know, you've seen it. Groups of animals act in concert, birds flocking, fish schooling. I just saw a group of deer just go by a moment ago. We all know that synergy. We see it in sports teams. Uh, so you take the seemingly impossible and you make it possible. You swarm the conflict with new ideas, with bridging ideas. You swarm the conflict with new perspectives and you swarm it with different influences. Third siders who can be brought in who can help the, the parties find a conflict. Same thing happened in Colombia, which I mentioned earlier, seemingly impossible conflict. President Santos invited a small group of peace advisors. Uh, one fellow had been a former leader of Marxist guerrillas, so he really knew how they thought. 
One, one person had been the foreign minister of Israel during the Oslo peace accords. One person had been the chief negotiator for the Northern Ireland conflict. And myself and the four of us constituted a kind of third side where we, our job was to help President Santos and his advisors prepare for these negotiations, strategize. In other words, go to the balcony and to help them build a bridge to the other side, to the guerrillas, to put an end to this 50 year civil war. It wasn't easy. It had all kinds of obstacles. It took seven years. Uh, it, uh, but the result was, you know, President Santos uh, uh, even was rewarded with a Nobel Prize. But the most important thing was it was a win, 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 is that all sides benefited. It turned a lose, lose, lose situation into a situation where the whole country benefited. And that's what's needed here in this country right now as we face this election. We need the same thing. We need to go to the balcony, stay calm, count the votes. We need to build bridges. We need to understand that we need to unify the country and get through this together. And we need to do that by activating the third side in this country. As a third sider, you can be on one side, but you, you stand for the whole, for the whole democracy, for the future of the country. So in dealing with these crises in short, if we don't find a way to take care of the whole and integrate it into our negotiations, you know, we all suffer in the end. Our families suffer, our work organizations, our communities. That's why the third win is so crucial. Fundamentally, win-win is not sustainable without that third win. And that's why I believe we need a more, um, we need a, a more ambitious, uh, more audacious form of negotiation, which has these kinds of three pillars. The work on ourselves, which is the balcony, the work with the other, which is the bridge, and the work with the whole, which is the third side. That's, that's what I call BB3. And I believe this kind of work is gonna be critical as key to our prosperity, uh, our ability to achieve societal well-being, and certainly our ability to get to peace. So people often ask me, uh, after all the work I've done on war zones around the world, you know, difficult intractable conflicts, whether in the end, whether I'm a an optimist or a pessimist. And I'd like to say neither. What I am is a possibilist. I believe in human possibility. And I believe it is possible to do this. It's not easy to deal with these conflicts, any of the conflicts, whether it's conflicts in our family, our workplace, or in the larger world. But I believe it's possible. And I invite you to join me as a fellow possibilist so that we can get to yes, even in the challenging crises of today. And I leave you with this question, if not us, who? And if not now, when? Thank you. Thank you so much, William. That, that was uh, very enlightening. Um, we have several questions from the audience. First one from John Semin. He asks, how would you help the US Senate come to agreement on a new COVID stimulus package? That's a really good question. Um, I think if just taking what we just said, it, I think it's, it's, it's important to help us step back to the balcony for a moment and realize right now in the Senate, of course, uh, Democrats and Republicans are fighting each other in anticipation of this election. You have the president in there, but it's, it's really important to step back for a moment and go to the balcony and realize that as we, that, that there's a larger view, there are millions of people who are losing their jobs in this country. There are millions of people who are suffering to basically, you know, I, I would maybe perhaps invite some of the key senators out to, I like to invite people out to a physical balcony, out to a place of nature just outside of DC, as, as I've done before with, with other similar settings and actually have them talk to each other. Uh, in a, in, a, in a more balcony perspective and just think about the future of the country, think about the people who are suffering. And then, then there comes the bridge. There needs to be ways to bridge the interests of both sides. It really begins with a lot of listening. Uh, but there are ways in which both sides, I would write the victory speeches for the Democrats and for the Republicans in which they can say to their constituencies, we delivered, we took care of you. So they both look good. That's extremely important to them. That's where I would start. And 
because they themselves not always may be able to do it, I would activate the third side, for example, uh, uh, business and labor, which have a key interest in, in the economy and in the economy not crashing to actually put constructive influence to bear on the senators to say, hey, we've got to reach an agreement. So I think it's, it's a combination again of balcony, bridge, third side that would allow us to reach an agreement in this case. Thank you. Um, on maybe slightly a more personal level of negotiation within groups, Pamela Stragate has asked, how, how do you negotiate with a bully or someone who has very different values and criteria, whose baseline appears to be win-lose? Yes, that's a really good question. And so it's one of the great challenges is, uh, and this is where, again, I would say, when you're dealing with a bully, the most important thing you can do first is go to the balcony uh, because the bully is trying is making you reactive, making you fearful and whatever. So whatever you can do to step back for a moment, because when you're in that reactive state, that's when the bully takes advantage of you. That's when the bully really gets you. If you can be in your best state, your optimal state. So the first thing is you've got to you know, exercise some self-control and whatever those methods that, that everyone put in the chat those are the methods. Then you can sort of see, okay, how do I deal with the bridge? How do I bridge? And let me just give you an example. Um, comes from Steven Spielberg. Uh, when he was 13, he was facing a situation of a bully. 15 year old bully was bigger and beat him up, roughed him up, uh, made his life pure hell, pure nightmare for, for an entire year. He used to like run home from school, dive under the bed, call out safe to himself. So one day he thinks, how do I get this bully off my back? You know, he's on the balcony for a moment. How do I build him a bridge as it were? So he goes up to the bully one day and he says, you know, I'm uh, making a movie, a whole movie. He was making movies in, the, in those days about uh, fighting the Nazis. And I was wondering if you'd like to play the war hero in my movie. Well, the bully laughs in his face, but a couple of days later, he changes his mind grudgingly says, okay, Young Spielberg dresses up the bully in a backpack and fatigues and makes him a war hero in his movie. And after that, Spielberg says, that bully became his best friend. His best friend in high school was this bully who would beat him up. How did he do that? By, from the balcony perspective, under, listening, understanding, why does a bully bully? Why does a bully bully? It's, it may seem that they're really strong, but actually underneath there's weakness, there's insecurity. He, what does a bully want? He wants power. He wants to protect himself. He wants a sense of control. He wants to look good. So what did Spielberg do? He made him a hero in his movie, which met those basic needs. And that's how he transformed the bully into his best friend. Wow, <laughs> that's really great. Um, here's a question from Katie Exum. How can you de-escalate the swarm effect when the effect is negative to the negotiation? Okay, so uh, well, the, the whole idea of sw the swarming is a is a positive effect from the third side, right? So sometimes there are outsiders who are playing a negative effect, uh, and they need to be countered. And one of the things challenges I think as a, in when you're thinking about how do you activate the third side, which acts as a kind of like a social immune system. You know, when your body's being attacked, you have an immune system that, that activates. And the same thing socially is what the third side plays that role. Think of it that way. And what you, what you can do is you, it's, it's like as a technique, for example, what I like to do is you like take out a piece of paper and you, in the left-hand column, you write winning coalition. In the right-hand column, you write blocking coalition. So where's the blocking coalition? As you mentioned, the negative effect, who are those people who are blocking the possibility of getting to yes? And then list the people who could be potentially in your winning coalition. And then think strategically how you can take players who are in the blocking coalition and move them to the winning coalition. You know, for example, I'll just give you an example. In Colombia, um, when in the very beginning of the negotiations, the question was, how do you bring the FARC to the table, the guerrillas? that had fought for 50 years in the jungles. What uh, President Santos did was in that blocking coalition was those who were supporting the FARC. 
And the two biggest supports for the FARC were Fidel Castro in Cuba, where his big inspiration, and Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. So the first thing he did was he went to see Chavez and he persuaded Chavez that he could look good, again, his victory speech by being a peacemaker. And so Chavez moved to the winning coalition. He then decided to put the negotiations in Havana, Cuba and Fidel and his brother Raul be supported the negotiations. So basically you take those potentially negative influences and by negotiating with them, you make them positive influences that allow you then to make a deal. Uh, thank you. Here's a question from Luis. Are there ever more than three sides? Yes, uh, oftentimes, uh, thank you, Luis, uh, there are many sides. Uh, sometimes in negotiations, there's, you know, dozens of sides. And that's one of the problems, you know, the challenges in negotiation. You know, when I was a graduate student, uh, my colleague, Jim Sabanius, was writing his thesis about the law of the sea negotiations, where there were 150 different parties, all the countries in the world at the time, who were negotiating about the law of the sea, about how to divide up resources that lie in two thirds of the world, world's uh, surface. So it was, uh, it was an incredibly complicated negotiation. And the way when you have to face so much complexity, paradoxically, the way to deal with it is to look for simplicity. And the technique that they used was called the single negotiating text, which was the third side in this case, uh, led by Tommy Koh, who was the foreign minister of Singapore at the time, basically had one piece of paper, one proposal that was always open and said, okay, you know, here's a potential proposal. And everyone then could basically criticize that proposal. And, you know, there were, there were places where there was agreement, there were places where there was disagreement that were in brackets. And the whole question was, how do you continually improve that single negotiating text until you had a law of the sea treaty? So there are techniques that we can use creatively, bridging techniques like the single negotiating text. And in that case, of course, it benefited, of course, from a strong, very skillful third side in the form of the Singaporean foreign minister. Thank you. Um, several of our participants are, are looking for an answer for this question. Who gets to determine what benefits the whole? Both sides will have their own ideas. Absolutely. So uh, no one determines that what the whole basically determines what's the benefit of the whole. I mean, but basically, if you think about the third side, let me give you an example. Um, in South Africa, which had been a protracted conflict that no one, everyone thought, most people thought this is going to go on forever, you know, just be civil war forever, civil strife in South Africa. And what happened was uh, the the third side emerged in the form of um, uh, women's groups, university students, labor unions, business organizations, the church was very important, and a, a civil society came together that essentially a third side that, that was the, the voice of the whole. It was, the vo it was so widespread. They formed something called the National Peace Accord where you had peace committees from the very top of the country down to every neighborhood, where you had rich and poor, black and white, you know, different religions and so on, different occupations, where people worked together with the police to reduce the violence so that the country could make a, a transition to, to democracy. And uh, so that's what's key is, is the, the, the third side is the, is the voice of the whole. No one gets to say it, but it's the collective uh, voice that comes out of many, many different voices. Okay, so our next top question, and we're, we're running out of time, so this may be the last one, we'll see. Um, how do you negotiate with someone who negates facts? Example, the COVID epidemic does not exist. Exactly, not easy uh, to negotiate with someone who negates the facts. And uh, what I find is, in those situations, just bringing more facts doesn't usually change their mind. Uh, what really, th those instances where they, where, where they change their mind is you listen to them, 
you treat them with respect rather than as an ignoramus. You sit down and say, how did you arrive at that? How did you arrive at the facts? How, 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 do, how do you arrive? You, you show curiosity, openness and curiosity to their perspective. And then slowly, you know, point out, for example, that their friends and people that they care about are points of influence, that how come they think that they're essentially COVID or why are they dying and so on. And you gradually, indirectly help them. You can't change their mind, but you can create a kind of an environment in which they themselves can help change their mind. Great. Okay. I think this is going to be the last question. <clears throat> um, what do you do if you realize the other party doesn't want to negotiate, but just manipulate you to reach his interests? Right. So this is why, again, you have to, to, re to recognize that you need to go to the balcony because sometimes you're so deep in it, you don't see it. Going to the balcony allows you to see from your analysis of their interests and watching them, that they're actually just using negotiation as a tool. They're not interested in reaching a deal. On the balcony is where you think through what are your interests, what are your key interests, and what's your BATNA. So for example, in the negotiation with uh, Bilio Diniz, for example, when I asked him, what's the prize for him? He said, freedom, that's what he wanted. Then I said, well, imagine that this conflict goes on, the other side's not at all interested in negotiation. How are you gonna give yourself that freedom? Well, he said, well, I want freedom to make deals. Well. Maybe I don't have to wait. I can go ahead and make other business deals. I want freedom to spend time with my family. I don't need to wait. I can take my family on a holiday. So he basically created a strong alternative for him, a strong BATNA, which was there. And paradoxically, having that strong BATNA made him less dependent on a deal psychologically, and thus actually facilitated reaching an agreement. So in those situations, go to the balcony, think through your BATNA, implement your BATNA, and then maybe, who knows, maybe the other side changes their mind as they did in this situation. So I just wanna say, um, just in conclusion, I really, I know these are difficult times. Uh, the, the crises that we're facing are unparalleled. Uh, they're leading to lose, lose, lose outcomes. And what I invite you to think about is the possibility that we can change the game. And I really wanna wish you much success, much health to you and your families and your countries and uh, much success in getting to a wise yes. Thank you. William, thank you so much for this um, illuminating hour. And thank you to all of you uh, participants, your wonderful comments and chat, your questions. Um, we hope you'll stay connected with the program on negotiation. Come to our website. Lots of free materials to read, things to think about as you continue learning about negotiation, this all important skill for all of us. So thank you very much. We wish you well.